But Lord, we give ourselves to you afresh today. This is our act of worship. Why? Because we love you, Lord. We love you with all of our hearts. And Lord, let us not lean on our own understanding, but let us acknowledge you in all of our ways, in all of the way that we think. Lord, we want to acknowledge you. So it is you that will make our paths straight. And Lord, we are living in a day where we need to be walking that straight path. We need to be hearing what you are saying, both through your word, through your spirit, and Lord, in your prophetic encounters with us. You are wanting to speak to your people. So Lord, I pray now, speak to your people today. So Lord, that we can have wisdom and understanding to understand the times and the seasons that we are living in. Lord, not for us to look good, but for you to be lifted higher. And we thank you that we live in this day and in this age. Like never as a time such as this. And we thank you, Lord. But Lord, I pray now, give us ears to hear eyes to see and a heart and a mind to understand in jesus name in jesus name now welcome everyone welcome that worship was just beautiful wasn't it you just felt to be in the presence of the lord and lots of thumbs up you know um sometimes you know heidi and i you know we can be sat here and you know, it can be a bit lonely because you're not getting, you know, you're not getting that sort of like feedback. But as I say, we're not doing it for you. We're doing this unto the Lord. This is what we do. This is our spiritual act of worship. And uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, well, it's been an interesting week uh, for me personally. And um, I know that for some of you, it's been an interesting week as well. Uh, we've just been having a chat before and Matt had his operation, quite a major one put off. And we got June, you know, having good news and, uh, you know, about certain things. But, you know, what's the Lord saying? What is the Lord saying? Because, you know, here I am, you know, I came back on Friday after seeing my mother, spending some few days with Joshua and myself, driving seven hours back down there and almost seven hours back and, um, I spent some, you know, some good quality time with my mum after lockdown, um, had a great time, came back and then heard about Matt and was praying for Matt. And then Matt was taken to hospital for the night before on some Friday. And then suddenly it's all cancelled. And I'm thinking, oh, well, OK, um, I better do the talk. <laughs> I, be be I better prepare for the talk, you know, because obviously Matt was a bit disappointed and he should have been doing it today. But stepped in and you know the last minute and so I just thought you know what I'm just going to do what I've always done I'm just going to spend some time with the Lord and see what he wants to say and I've been contemplating I've been thinking I have been praying over a particular passage for years and I'm going to tell you something I'm going to be very transparent and I want you to perhaps think along the same lines because I, don't, I, I want to know this word even more. I want to have this word at the forefront of my forehead, written on my arm. I want to understand what the Lord is saying, because there are great prophecies written about the second coming of the Lord. Right the way through. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Habakkuk, you know, Daniel, you know, Book of Revelation, Paul wrote about it, you know, and yet we in the church, can I just say something? I think we're lazy. I think here in the West, the West church, we are lazy. Can I tell you why? Because what we do is we get on the internet and there's, you know, there's nothing wrong in that. And it's like the people saying to Moses, Moses, you go up into the mountain let God speak to you, and then you bring it down and tell us what God is saying. 
Well, this is what we've done in the West. We go on our iPads or on our uh, computers and we get our favorite teachers up and, and you know, or, or pastors or whatever, and, or our favorite people up and we, we ask them to give us a message. We get a message and we think that was good and it lasts about a week and then we want another message, we want to be fed again. So we go to this, you know, we listen to another lot and get fed and a week goes by and we've forgotten what was preached two weeks ago. So I personally haven't listened to anybody for, I don't know how long. I honestly don't know how long. I haven't listened to any teachings. I haven't listened to you know, anybody. And I want to, don't get me wrong, I want to. But you know what? I want to make up my own mind. I want to make up my own mind and understand this word a lot more. So everything I preach, I'm not hearing from any preacher or teacher or you know, my favorite, whatever. Because I want you, listen to me, I want you to tear up all of your beliefs of eschatology. Eschatology of the end times. I don't want you to rip it up. I want you to rip up everything that you think that you know. Because that's what I've done. And, and, and that's a good thing. You know, I'm allowed to change my mind. As I get revelation, you know, from the word. As I go deeper into the word, the word sticks in you. It just feeds you. It makes you hungry for more. And the more I get into it, the more I'm going saying, oh, Lord, I need help. Holy Spirit, I need help. So I sat upstairs yesterday for six hours, six hours straight, trying to iron out exactly what I'm talking to you about. Listen. Whatever your position is, whatever it is in your, your eschatology, you know, this end time, uh, end time prophecy, end time, the end times, whatever it is, you know, how do you know it's going to happen? Okay, here's a question for you. I'm going to give you a little, little where, where does it start mentioning about the seven seals in the Bible? Don't look. You should know it. Revelation 6. Where does it start talking about the trumpets and the bowls? Revelation 8 and 9. Can you tell me what they say? What's the seventh seal? Heaven goes silent for half an hour. What's the fifth trumpet? Stars, meteors falling down. What's the sixth bowl? Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Is we don't know the Bible very well because we're lazy. We want to be like the people go, Moses, you here. Instead of Holy Spirit, come and speak to me as I go into this word and, and, and where I struggle on things, will you help me? Because we're all right about Isaiah 11, verse 2, about the sevenfold spirit of God. But do you know what my prayer has been for over a year now? Lord, give me wisdom and understanding. Give me wisdom and understanding for this word. Give me wisdom and understanding of the revealing of you, Jesus. Give me wisdom and why? Why? We need to know the word. And we need to make up our own minds. Not from our favorite preacher or teacher, but we need to make up our own minds. Because after six hours, I came down the stairs. <laughs> I must have looked like Boris because all my hair was up. And, you know, because I'm in deep travail. I'm in deep travail thinking everything I understood, I'm now tearing up. Or everything I think I understood, I'm now tearing up. How do you know when you're going to be raptured out? Pre-trip? Before the seven years? Well, where do you get that from? Mid-trip? Where do you get that from? Pre-roth? Where do you get that from? Oh, because I heard it from so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Tear it up. Please tear it up. Get into the word and go deeper. We, we need to, folks. Because why? Why is God? I mean, I know what God is. I asked the Lord, why am I on this journey? Do you know why? Because 
when we get into this word and we get some revelation from the word, we get some understanding from the word and it's in us from the word. The Holy Spirit will come alongside and start whispering the secrets. The Lord will come to us and give us deeper revelation, extra biblical revelation on the word. And the last time I was like this was back in 2013, where I was getting from the word, reading the word, getting thinking, I'm going mad. And you've heard me speak, you know, talk about this before. And it's almost like I've, you know, 2013, I'm, I'm in it in 2021. I'm exactly the same. Lord, I, I just want to. So what I've decided to do is tear up any understanding that I might have. And I'm going into, back into the word, really deep into the word. Because I want to bring you something again from my, not just six hours. I mean, it took me six hours just to write down a few notes, you know, and I, have, I didn't even, I did not have time because I couldn't keep up to get my notes here. They're all written out. I didn't have, I couldn't keep up. So I had to write everything down in longhand. I didn't have time to put it on, you know, my iPad or my computer, you know. And so it's raw. This is completely raw. But I, I used to think, because the Bible says that the Lord, you know, we don't go through the wrath of God. I used to think that maybe that's when the rapture, maybe that's when the rapture you know, of, of his folk happen, his pre wrath I don't know if I believe that anymore. I told you I'm going to be transparent. I don't know if I believe that anymore. And as I go into the talk, I'll under, you'll understand a little bit more of why I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like, I'm humbly coming before you because I'm going to give you what, I've read in the scriptures, I've prayed over and over and still praying over and getting some little bit of revelation. Now, I've put, you know, when the Lord comes to you and gives you, you know, and speaks to you face to face, you know, I'm just putting that to a side for a minute. You know, because what the Lord speaks to me about in revelation and gives me revelation, especially revelation on uh, Revelation chapter 12. You know, I had a face to face encounter with the Lord. Now, that was my encounter. That was my, you know, experience with the Lord. And I've had, you know, a few. Um, and I've had prophetic dreams, very, very prophetic. I had visions. Um, and those are personal to me. But yet, what I try and do is I try and match it up with the word. I try to. Some, some of it you can't. When you see the Lord roaring down a street, you know, that's called Coper Avenue. You know, that's not in the Bible. Physically, I see him as a lion roaring down the streets of Cope Avenue, but it was real to me. It spoke to me that I believe the Lord is going to land here in the UK, outside you know, our ministry building, and we're going to see a move of God, where it's going to bring in the fear of the Lord. Because that's, that's going to, that, that I believe with all of my heart that's going to happen. I believe we're going to start seeing that the spirit of the fear of the Lord will start dominating. You know, and, and we need it. We need it. But I want to bring to you today, um, looking at the words, so you're going to need your Bible. Um, we're going to need some, I've got, I mean, last yesterday I had three different versions of the Bible, four different, actually, four different versions of the Bible. And I was going to one, going to the other, and there's slight differences. The main message is out there, but there's slight differences. There's slight word changes. There's slight... And I was desperate, just, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying? Why is this slightly different from that? I mean, it's the same word, but it's just different. Um, I find the NIV really easy to understand, but it doesn't go into the depth. I find some of reading the New King James, I find it quite difficult because, you know, um, it, it, you have to really look at it, you know, and, and I had dyslexia. You know, I struggle with reading. Um, I struggle with spelling. I, I even struggle sometimes with my pronunciation of words. You know, and it's just something I've, I've had to cope with all of my life. And, uh, 
yet there's a there's a desperation in me to understand the word to read the word i don't find it easy so i started looking at the new american standard version um i think it's called um and i've got that on my phone now and um i'm looking at the word through here i then look at the new king james version here um so new king james and i and then i ask heidi can, heidi, can you get your niv ready because i'm going to need somebody to read parts of that but i want to i want to take you deep into one of the most for me for me one of the most prophetic chapters in the bible that if we can get some understanding then we will be like it says in Isaiah 60 and Daniel 12, where it says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Don't you want to be wise? Don't you want to have wisdom and understanding? <laughs> to the seasons that we live in? Why? So that we can start proclaiming like Moses and Aaron when the Lord was going to take a whole group of his people out, the Israelites, the Jews, out of Egypt and bring them to their own land, bring them to the promised land. You know, and, and we know the story. We know the story. But, but Aaron and Moses started saying, this is going to happen. And, and, and that's going to happen. Well, we can start saying, well, guess what? A white horse is going to go forth. And what, this is what it symbolizes. It's a man who's going to make war. He's going to go out and to conquer. Oh, and, and then you're going to see. Then you're going to see a, 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 another type coming forward. And it's going to bring war. And then from the war, there's going to be sickness and, and a shortage of food. And then it's going to bring an illness. And we're going to start bringing these events from the Bible into real life, you know, to tell people what is coming and why is it coming? Well, the Lord's returning. It's, it's to prepare us. It's to refine his bride. It's, it's to prepare us for the coming king. But there has to be a purification that goes on. There has to be a restoration that goes on. He is going to restore. It says he's going to refine us with fire. Do you think that's going to be all nice and gooey and goosey and, and all the rest? No. It's going to be the, in the toughest time the world has ever seen. But there are going to be voices out there to be witnesses to him. It's that friends of the bridegroom in the midnight hour calling out the bridegroom's coming. There are going to be a body of people that are going to start prophesying from the word. Therefore, we've got to know the word, not from somebody else. I must admit, I'm looking forward, you know, uh, to go and listen to some what some people are saying, to see what they're saying, to see whether, you know, they're saying something similar to me. You know, but but I'm not going to them to try and get whether their words, you know, I want to know what the Lord is saying to me. But I want to take you on a journey now. I want you to get your Bibles out. I want you to, to really hunker in, tighten in. I want you to follow this. It's, as I said last week, these talks are not going to be succinct. They're not going to be boom, 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 boom. Um, but I want to go deep. I really want to go deep. Because if we can have some understanding about this event, it lines up prophetically the end time es eschatology and the events that happen. You know, and, and I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my opinion on how I used to think. Um, it hasn't changed my opinion what the Lord has said. Because as I say, that the, everything that the Lord Jesus has said is going to be the spine of the book. And everything else hangs on to the spine of the book. So when you have a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord and he comes and teach, teaches you from the book, you pay attention. Just as when Jesus was teaching his disciples and followers, he started saying some things. Well, very soon, guys, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be crucified. And, you know, but I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to rise. And, he, and these guys were going, what? And he started teaching them out of the Bible, 
out of the Old Testament. These things must happen. These things must be fulfilled. But he started teaching some things so we can understand. So we're going to have a look in the book of Daniel again. We're going to have a look. I think Daniel, for me, is the most prophetic book. The most, for me. I love the book of Daniel. I have been in the book of Daniel for years. I have preached from the beginning, from chapter 1 to chapter 12, you know, all the way through the book of Daniel, verse by verse. You know, and I've changed my mind on a few things from when I preached this a few years ago to where I am today. But I want to take you to, for me, one of the most prophetic um, end time esch eschatology. And we're going to look at chapter eight. And there is some, you know, a lot of, lot of things have been said by a lot of very good, good people. A lot of, you know, brilliant minds have said. For me, people like Chuck Missler and, and um, people like him. And, and, and yet, you know, I, I haven't really listened to it for, for years, but I'm just going back to things. and I'm trying to make it my own mind. But I want to have a look at some verses, especially some verses in chapter eight. Because, oh, wow, if we get this, we can start lining up events and counting days. Now, people are going to say, but Andy, you know, the Lord, you know, says we, we're not to know the day or the hour. Well, Daniel did. Daniel was given really incredible to the day and the hour. From his day right the way through to the return of the Lord. He was given days, you know, like, you know, the Antichrist, you know, when does he get his power? At the beginning of the seven years, halfway through the seven years, or towards the end of the seven years? When does the Antichrist get the power? When does he start coming against us in, 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 a, in ferocity and wrath? That's what the Bible says. When does he come against us? Do we just see the Antichrist go, da da, here I am? No, it's a series of events. And I, and I always use things like, because you know, I, I study history, um, the events of the Second World War, you know, the rise of Hitler, the rise of the Nazi Party. I, I use those sort of events because they're in my mind. And, you know, when Hitler came to power, he was known, well, he, it took him a few years to come to power, but when he got arrested and he, and he was put in jail, um, where Heidi's great grandmother made him a sandwich and it gave him a cup of tea. <laughs> wow. Imagine if she knew what he was going to bring. This is back in 1929. You know, he gets arrested and he gets put in jail and he writes this book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle. And he outlines in, in that book, his hatred, for the Jews, outlines it. Then he comes on the, on the scene and he starts politically saying this and you know, he starts you know, becoming this, this, this man. He didn't have many people following him. He didn't have thousands or hundreds. In fact, they started taking the mickey out of him in 1930, 31. They started calling him the little corporal because he was a corporal in the First World War, was wounded. Uh, and they started calling him the little corporal because he was a little man, and they started taking the mickey out of him. So he stood up in 1933, and he goes for, you know, tries to become the vice chancellor, um, and, he, and, and there's a guy called Bismarck who, you know, he is, he is in charge of things, and he eventually, you know, in 1933, he goes up and he wins maybe 10, 15% of the vote. Oh, but how things change. By 1937, he's in power. And this is what the Antichrist is going to be like. He is going to be over. People are going to say, is that? Nah, nah, that can never be in. Because he's going to start off small. He's going to, there's going to be nothing about him. But then very, very quickly, in a short space of time, he starts growing bigger and bigger and bigger. But when does he get... The fullness of the devil, the, the dragon, Satan. When does Satan give him his power? Well, Daniel tells us. John tells us. 
But before he comes into the power, certain things take place and you can just map through those things. But when do the seals get broken? When do the trumpets get broken? No sound, start sounding. When do the bowls start getting poured out? Where are we when all this, these things happen? Well, my thinking is we're going to be here because of what Daniel says. So I'm just laying a foundation. So let's turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. For me, one of the most prophetic end-time eschatology understandings. If we can grasp it. And I'm not going to read the whole way through the chapter. There's 27 verses. But these 27 verses have plagued scholars, theologians, leaders for, for years, plagued them. They've written books. They disagree with each other. You know, and that's all right. What I keep saying, we're allowed to have robust conversation. I've had robust conversation, you know, with a few people. But here we are. I'm just going to gloss through. Verses one and two. This is incredible. Here is Daniel. He must be in his 80s because he got carried away probably when he was 16 years old. He sees the destruction of Solomon's temple. Sees it. You know, then he lives through three kings in Babylon, starting with Nebuchadnezzar, and he has these visions. But look at this. I love this. In verse one, it says, in verse two, and I saw in a vision. And it so happened that while I was looking, I was in Shushan. He was in Sushan, the cathedral in Sushan, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that now he moves. He's by a river. Ule, Ula, however you want to pronounce it. U-L-A-I. You lay, you know, and, and, and he's he suddenly he's in a citadel and now he's by a river in, instantly. And in a vision, it's like having he's in it. It's interactive. He starts having discourse and he starts listening to two heavenly bodies having a conversation. But he starts seeing something happen. He sees um, in this vision right up to verse 20, the next 20 verses. He sees um, a ram with two horns, and one of the horns is bigger than the other. And he's, you know, and then he sees a male goat come out of it and destroy the ram. And then the, the male goat, out of the male goat comes four kingdoms, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then out of the four, the, the, the four horns that come, there comes a little horn. There comes a little horn out of the ram. And this little horn becomes fierce, incredibly fierce. Now, we know from verse 20, the angels give Daniel, tells him what it's about. The ram that you saw was having two horns. Well, these are the kings of Media and Persia. This is the Medo-Persian Empire. That is, one's going to be bigger than the other. The Persian Empire was bigger than the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian. It was bigger. It grew stronger. And this is where you see in ancient history um, the fight about the Greeks, you know, the Battle of Thermopylae, you know, where, where the Spartans, the 300, well, it wasn't 300. They had 3,000 Medes, th sorry, Thespians from, from Thebes. Then they weren't actors. The Thebes were incredibly warlike. Inc they weren't going. Your turn, come on, open. No, they were like the Spartans. They, the, these 3,000 were like the Spartans. And the Spartans came along and then to, to meet this huge army of, 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 of a Persian king. And we know the story. So there was this great battle going on against the, the Persians by Greece. The Greeks won some, they lost some, but the Greek were not a united you know, country. You had, you know, the Macedonians, you had the, the Athenians, you had the Thebes, you had Sparta, you had all these factions going on. And they were never united until one man comes along, the goat, which is the king of, of Greece. He unites these people together, which is Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great's father, Philip, who was murdered, and then Alexander at the age of 19 
comes in and be, becomes a king, he made his son promise to absolutely destroy the Persians. And, and that's exactly what Alexander the Great did. He destroyed the Persian army. Absolutely, there was no mercy shown with this army, and he became a great king. So we know from Daniel 8 that these things have taken place, you know, the rise, you know, of, of these four, four kingdoms, you know, that came around in 323 BC, when uh, Alexander the Great dies, and then the four generals, the four families, take over the ruling of these kingdoms in different areas. And we see this, and we've talked about it in Daniel 11. So we don't have to go through all of that again, but it's when in verse eight, we see um, the death of Alexander, these four kingdoms come in. But then look what happens in verse nine of chapter eight. And out of one of them, out of one of these kingdoms comes a little horn who grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Wow. That is really, really interesting. So a lot of people have said that this is the rise of the little horn as Antiochus Epiphanes. A lot of people have said that, that this little horn that arises comes out of the one of the kingdoms and it's Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, when we read the next chapters, the next, sorry, the next verses, it can't be Antiochus Epiphanes. If you want to know his real title, it's Antiochus IV Epiphanes. It can't be him. Well, Andy, how do you say that? Well, we're going to come to that because we've got a problem. I want you to just, we're going to read a little bit more from, from verse 11. He even exalts himself as high as the Prince of Hosts. And who's the Prince of Hosts? Well, the American Standard Version gives us a better, I think, a better translation of that verse. It says here, um, in verse 11, it even magnified itself, it, not him, it magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes didn't go against the host of heaven, which is Jesus, the prince of the commander. He's our commander in chief. You've often heard me say it. Well, it can't be Antiochus Epiphanes because, yes, Antiochus Epiphanes went against the glorious land, Israel. He took away the sacrifices that were happening in the, the now rebuilt temple, the second temple. He took away the sacrifices. He, he killed 40,000 Jews. He made another 40,000 run to the hills. Um, and it sounds like that he's, this is the little horn. However, we read further on, because of the transgressions, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. And he did all this and prospered. Then Daniel says, then I heard a holy one speaking to another holy one. He's now hearing a discourse going on between two angels. Saying to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices, the transgression of desolation and giving of both the sanctuary and the host be trampled underfoot? So he hears this being said. Now, the angels understood it, but they wanted Daniel to understand it. So Daniel was listening in, and it was like, he's listening now. One of the angels says, well, he's listening. Ask me the question. Ask me the question so he can get understanding. So here it is, folks. 
Then I heard the Holy One. I'm reading out the uh, American, New American Standard Version. Then I heard a Holy One speaking. Another one Holy said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both a holy place and the host to be trampled? He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored interpretation of the vision. So that wasn't in the Bible, by the way. I'm just that's an interpretation. So when you read it in the New King James Version, because the transgressions of the army were given over to the horn to oppose daily sacrifice, he cast truth to the ground and did all of us. Then I heard the Holy One speaking to another Holy One and said to the third one that was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices, the transgressions of desolation, slightly different, and giving both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled? Verse 14, he said to me, for 2,300 days, and there's an, this is the New King James, there's a star there, and when you have a look at the star, it says evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be clean. Oh, wow. 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 So let's have a look at Antiochus Epiphanes. Because what people did is what they try and do is to make their theory try and fit into the scriptures. They try and almost like shoehorn, you know, to try and get it in, get that foot in, you know, into a, a size eight foot into a four, and we'll make it fit. And that's what they try and do to make this thing about the little horn being Antiochus Epiphanes. But historically, it can't be Antiochus Epiphanes. Because what people did is they said, well, evenings and mornings, that means that it's double the 2,300. So it's now 4,600. Well, that's, that's just, that got chucked out quite early on. But then they're saying, well, then it's evenings and mornings. That means it's half of that time. It's half of 2,300, which we know is 1,150 days. Ah, so let's take that. So if we divide and we go down this road of it's half, uh, it's half that 2,300. Let's go down that route to try and shoehorn whether this is Antiochus Epiphanes. Well, Antiochus Epiphanes, we know that he has, he, if we, if we fit, try and fit this into 1,050 days, the Anti Antiochus Epiphanes, the desolation of the, of the temple happens in December of 1000, uh, sorry, 167 BC. We can put it down to history. So in December of 167 BC, he puts up an altar in the holy place of Zeus, and he says, worship this God. He's had his pig stew thrown around the Holy of Holies. He put Zeus, a statue of Zeus, and, and he even might, he tried to get the Zeus's face look like him. And he said, basically, worship me, worship Zeus. This is my God. This is the, the desolation that Jesus is talking about. Well, it isn't the desolation that Jesus is talking about. He quotes out of Daniel. He says there is going to be a future event that is going to cause the abomination that causes desolation. Written by Daniel. This is a future event. Because Antiochus Epiphanes had died. So it can't be Antiochus Epiphanes because Jesus is quoting when you see the abomination that causes desolation as spoken by the prophet Daniel. Well, Daniel speaks about it here. So here's another reason why it can't, the little horn cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes, because as I said, he did this in 167 BC. And he, he lived for another three years. Three years. So if we add the three years of 360, because we're in the Jewish calendar, not the Gregorian calendar, 360 times by three, it falls short of around about 60 days of the 1,150 days. Fall short. Now, the Bible for me is precise. It doesn't just fall short, you know, 
of 60 days, you know, we can't shoehorn now Antiochus Epiphanes into this, into this verse. He is showing a future event. But we must have understanding, folk, of the 1,300, uh, sorry, the 2,300 days. But what is a day? We have to go to the Bible to understand the day. Well, we know from Le Revelation 1, verse 5, there was evenings and mornings, and it was called one day. So from the very first book, chapter 1, verse 5, evenings and mornings equals one day. Well, where else do we get it? Well, with Genesis 7, verse 4, and in verse 12, the flood, where Noah is in the flood. How long is he in the flood for? 40 days and 40 nights. He wasn't in there for 40 days and 40 nights equaling 80. And he wasn't there taking the 40 days and 40 nights down to 20. It meant 40 days and 40 nights for over a 40 day period. Do we understand that? Well, look at another one, Jonas. Well, we know all the story about Jonas. How long was he in the belly of the fish? Not a whale, it doesn't say a whale, it says a fish, a great fish. How long was he in the belly for? Well, it says three days and three nights. It wasn't six days and it wasn't one and a half days. It was literally three days total and three nights. Three 24 hour dividing of morning and evenings. Well, let's have another one from the New Testament. Well, the easiest one to go to is Jesus in the wilderness. In Matthew 12, verse 40, when, Matthew, when, when Jesus is taken into the wilderness, and how long was he there for? Well, it, was he there 40 days and 40 nights? Well, does that mean that he was, if we harvard, he was there for, for 20 days? Or if we double it, was he there for 80 days? No, it means 40 days. So we now can conclude and move on that the 2,300 days is literally 2,300 days. Well, then it becomes really, really interesting because we now know this is not Antiochus Epiphanes. This is Daniel being shown an event in his 80s. He must be about 85 now because he, get, he gets taken out of Jerusalem at probably at the age of 15. He then is at the end of the 70 years prophesied by the book of Jeremiah. That, and Daniel gets a revelation of that. He has understanding from the word about what Jeremiah wrote. It was going to be for 70 years. So we add those two together. He's around about 85. Give or take two or three years either side. He's an old man. And he has these series of visions. Not for himself. For us to have understanding of these end time events that we're going to see. So here we have this incredible um, thing, because I believe that verses from verses eight, nine and ten, right the way through, it's now talking about the Antichrist, the rise of the Antichrist and what he does, not Antiochus Epiphanes. It's what the Antichrist does, you know, and we're looking at that, you know, um, that this verse nine has to be about the Antichrist, just as Daniel 11, 21 to 45, and especially from 31 to 45 is, is yes, it's double layered. It's got these layers of, yes, it's, it's a future event of Antioch Epiphanies, but this is what I want, to want you to focus on, Daniel, because he spoke about it in chapter eight. In this vision, he's speaking about a future event that Jesus quotes on. When you see a person standing in the holy place committing abomination that's going to cause desolation, flee, get out. So we have to have understanding of where this happens. When does this happen? Well, I'm going to give you some theories um, and what I am, well, what, what some people have said, looking at different translations, you know, from the New King James Version or the NIV, 
um, and looking at what the New American Standard Bible says, or the New American Version Bible. I can't remember exactly, but um, but but you can almost get two different versions. And then I'm going to give you my understanding of these verses because they're crucial. Because he gives these versions, and then Daniel is so overwhelmed by what he has shown, he falls down as if dead, and, and an angel has to pick him up. And then the angel says to the other angel, Daniel, you know, uh, give, give Daniel you know, a, a thing of what, what this all means. And we see from verse 20, it's all about the ram, that's two horns, a king's of medium Persia, chapter verse 21, it's the goat. It's the male goat. It's the shaggy goat. If you read a different version, I like the one shaggy goat. Um, it's like a unicorn and, and the, that a large horn grows out of its eyes and then it's broken. The horn is broken and then four other horns stood in its place. This is talking about Alexander the Great. And then in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressions have reached the fullness, a king shall arise. Verse 23, a king will arise out of this these horns, having fierce features, who understand sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his power. Ah, not by his power. This is not Antiochus Epiphanes. This is the Antichrist. I want you to understand that. This is at the Antichrist, because who gives him this power? The devil does. But when does he give him the power? crucial to understand that when does he give him this power we're gonna and then he will destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive thrive can you that's incredible he's going to create absolute hell on earth but he prospers and he thrives god allows him to do this that's the most incredible thing god is allowing this him to do these things why why is God allowing these things to happen? Well, it's to refine you and me. It's to refine his people, the Jewish nation. There is a refining going on. We are going to be put through the fire. That's what the Bible says. Gold refined in the fire. Come buy from me gold that is refined in the fire. You know, we're going to go through the fire. And if you read Zechariah 12 and 13 and 14, oh, my word, his people, the Jewish nation, is going to go through the ringer. It's horrific. But it's to bring their people back because the Jewish nation is, is more secular than most of the West. Just look what's happening in Tel Aviv. And, you know, Tel Aviv is compared to Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, <laughs> in Daniel. So there has to be a turning around. And what does, what does a father do when he, when he tells his, you know, a, a child off? He chastises them. This is like a chastisement of a child to turn them around and to say, right, this is the correct way. But God is about to turn around us. Why? Well, one, his bride has got to be refined. It's got to be made pure and holy. Two, it's what I've said before. It's the throwing up of the wheat, us, and the chaff has to be blown through it, has to be blown out, because there is going to be a falling away amongst the church. And it's over this that the falling away is going to come. I believe it's the misunderstanding of estological times. It's the uh, it's a misunderstanding of, wow, we're going to be raptured out. Well, tell me where the Bible says that we're raptured out. Uh, it talks about it in Thessalonians. We'll come to that. But it doesn't say when the rapture happens or when whether it's a rapture. It just says you will be caught up into the heavens to be by me. When does that happen? Daniel tells us. So can you, I mean, I've always said, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. But folks, we're going to go through some stuff. I'm absolutely convinced of that. We are going to go through seven years of stuff. Seven years of stuff. 
but you do your study and then back it up with the word, not through somebody else's teaching, back it up through the word. But we have got to be what I've read out to you, Daniel 12, verse three. We've got to be shining with brightness, those that are wise. Those that are wise must shine with brightness. We have got to be like the sons of Ishikar from Ishikar um, chapter 12, verse 32, who understand the times and tell the people what to do. This is what we're going to do, is we're going to have an understanding of these times, start pronouncing them like Moses and Aaron. Ah, oh, right, so you've got that right. Tell us more, tell us more. It's like we were talking at the beginning with Tanya, you know, going through, I think she said the chapter one of Zechariah, I think, or Ezekiel chapter one. I, I can't remember. And, and oh, wow, that's, 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 that's great stuff. But tell you what, folks, there are people out there that know in these times and seasons are horrendous. The bowl of iniquity is full and they want understanding. They want to understand the times of the day that they are living in. They're going to be hungry for this. The church isn't. The church isn't hungry for this because most are saying, well, we're going to be, especially the charismatic Western church, we're, we're raptured out. Oh, it doesn't, doesn't hold for me. doesn't hold. When, what happens if they're not and they start seeing their families slaughtered? This is the falling away. You told us we were going to be taken out. You told us that we, we wouldn't be here. You told me, Pastor. You told me, great preacher man, that I looked on YouTube and had I followed all of your things. You told us that we're going to be taken out. But all of their interpretation is, is on supposition. It's nothing concrete. It's all, well, this verse can mean this. It doesn't mean that when you break it apart. As I say, you know, you know, you know, I'll get I'll get thumbs down and just mature up. <laughs> just just get some maturity in you. You're allowed to disagree with me, but then don't try and pull down my flag. And if you say it's a seven year and it's pre-trib, well, I won't pull down your flag. If that's what you believe, that's fine. But I believe there's going to be a great falling away. Why? Because Jesus tells us there's going to be a great falling away. So we, like the sons of Ishkar, have to have an, have an understanding of these times. So we will tell the people what they ought to do. But here's one, folks. A lot of people have, go back to verse 10. It grew, the little horn, to the host of heaven. It was cast down, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Well, it's saying that it grew up in stature to almost reaching, you know, the second heavens. And, and, and then suddenly it's thrown down and there's a treading that goes on. That's what these, this verse says. There's a treading, a trampling that goes on. Well, a lot of people have said this is out of Revelation 12, verse 7 and 9. So turn with me to Revelation 12, verse 7 and 9. War broke out in the heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels fought back. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. It's pretty, pretty obvious. This is talking about Satan, who deceives the whole world, was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast out with them. So this verse of Daniel 8, verse 10, people have equated it to this verse. But it can't be. It cannot be this verse. Because look, read it again. I'll read it out of the New American version. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and then trample them down. Well, hang on a sec. So you're telling me if this is the same as Revelation 12, 7 and 9, why would Satan be cast down and then trample on his own people? Why would Satan trample on these people that have been cast down with him? Because Satan is cast out of the second heavens and thrown down. But he doesn't trample on his own people. Read the verse again. Verse 10. 
cast some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. <laughs> it can't be Satan. It's talking about the Antichrist. Not, a, not Antiochus Epiphanes. It's talking about the Antichrist and what he does. He exalts himself as high as the Prince of Hosts, and by him, the Antichrist, the daily sacrifices are taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. It's talking about the devil in verse 11, but it's the Antichrist in verse 10. What's the Antichrist going to do? Well, he's going to literally magnify himself to be equal as the commander of hosts. And the host of stars and the host of heaven means us. It's us. Chapter 12 of Book of Revelation, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of the testimony, didn't love their lives to death. Satan is cast down. He is going to be casting down, and through his man, he's going to trample on these people, especially the Jews. Especially the Jews. He's going to trample on us. When Satan is cast down, that's when the Antichrist is given Satan's power. When, can you imagine? I mean, Satan is in the second heavens. He has got access to the throne room of God. He's called the accuser. Who does he accuse? Us. Where does he accuse us? In the throne room of God. He walks in and out of heaven. Between the second heaven and the third heaven where God is, you know, let's just keep it like that. Let's for it nice and simple. He walks into the throne room. We know that from Job. The book of Job, Satan walks into the very throne room of God and God turns around and says to Satan, have you seen my man? And we know, that's, that's, that's in the book of Job. But, but can you think now where Satan has lost his place in heaven? No more is he allowed to travel in and out of, of the heavenly places. He's lost his dominion in the second heavens and he's cast down to earth. Wow. Wow. The Bible tells us he is full of wrath because he knows then when that happens, his time is short. And Daniel tells us. The devil's cast down. But he will do two things first. First, he will take away the sacrifice, verses 11 and 12. He will take away the daily sacrifices and he will cast truth to the ground. He will cast truth to the ground. Our truth. We are to be the bearers of truth. But he's going to come after us. He did, he did all this and prospered. But here is the problem. I had this, somebody, a real good friend of mine, a real good friend of mine about two years ago, you know, and I know exactly where he was getting his teaching from, you know, and, and he came and said to me something really that just boggled my mind, boggled my mind. He started talking to me about the restrainer, you know, and, and that the restrainer, when the restrainer goes, we're taken out. And I'm thinking, I've never heard that. I've never read that. Where is this thing about the restrainer? And what does it mean? And he's and it's basically he was building his pre-trib rapture of when the Holy Spirit is taken out, being the restrainer. This is what he was quoting, the restrainer being the Holy Spirit. When the restrainer is, is taken out of the earth, we're all taken out with them. The removing of the, of the Holy Spirit. And this is where people, you know, I've, I've learned since, this is where people quote this and say it's the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I just want to give you my opinion on that from the word. Where do you find the word restrainer? Well, turn with me, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Right. But I, I've, I've got to give you some understanding of Thessalonians, the two books, the two letters, because there were letters written to the, the church in Thessalonica. I think I pronounced that right. It was the uh, Thessalonian church, you know, in, in, the, in the 
out in the um, Asia Minor area. He, he wrote to these churches. And, and one of the questions that he got, let's go back to, to 1 Thessalonians. The question that they were asking was this. Um, when, when are we taken out? You know, because we're worried about the people that have, have died and have buried. When we're taken out, what happens to them? So Paul in the first Thessalonians, the first letter, writes them, said, don't worry about that. When the Lord comes back, when the Lord comes back, they're taken out of the ground. They rise first. They go meet the Lord in the air. And then we're taken out. But it doesn't, Paul doesn't tell us when this happens. He does mention about a trumpet going off, which gives us a bit of a clue. The trumpet goes off, you know, and then there's a loud trumpet sounded in heaven and boom, you know. So is that talking about the seven trumpets? Could be, could be. But then what happened is after Paul had written to the Thessalonians, some false teaching came into the Thessalonian church because they were very immature. These false teachers started standing up and said, I've had a letter from Paul. I've had a letter from Paul. And basically what Paul is saying, he says, and he's told us, these false teachers, because there wasn't really a letter from Paul. He was, they were saying, you've missed it. The, 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 the time of this, you, you've missed the second coming of the Lord. So Paul is then writing back to them saying, that wasn't me, guys. I'm going to reiterate some things. So he says, brethren, verse, chapter, verse one of chapter two, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. So there it is. Paul is saying these letters haven't come from us. It doesn't come from us. Let no one deceive you. By that means, for that day will not come. So now Paul is saying that day hasn't happened yet because I'm going to give you two signs. And he's quoting out of Daniel. He starts quoting out of Daniel. He says that day hasn't happened because a falling away must come first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is directly out of Daniel. Directly out of Daniel. But then people start saying, let's go on. But you not, but but do you not remember? that when I was with you, I told you these things, that these things must happen first before we're taken out. So it's all about the second coming of the Lord. And now that you know what is restraining, that you may be revealed in his own time, that he may, the restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Who's the he? Well, it's showing himself who is God above all things. It's the devil. It's the Antichrist. It's this. He is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So can we just come to an agreement here? The restraining and the restraining going on is not the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the revealing of the son of lawlessness, the son of perdition. It's talking about the Antichrist and Satan exalting himself above all things. It's not the restraining. It's not the Holy Spirit. The one interpretation of the Holy Spirit is the enabler. Not the restrainer. It's the enabler to do things that we cannot do for ourselves. But here's a question. What is Paul talking about here? This is crucial to Daniel 8. Why, why would the devil, Satan, the dragon, 
restrain the Antichrist. Well, that's really simple. Really simple. He's restraining, he's holding back the son of perdition, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist. He's holding him back. Why? Because if he plays it too early, that means his time is short. His time is short. Sorry, Heidi, what did you want to say? I just wanted to back you up, Andy. So in Revelation 12, when it talks about the war where Satan is hurled down and it says now. So this is this is I'm just backing you up that the whole reason yep. that Satan wants to stop the Antichrist from being revealed is because Satan will get hurled down and then he empowers the Antichrist. And as it says in Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, because, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. So the devil wants to keep lots of time in the second heavens, in the heavenlies, where he can manipulate and do all the rest and the influencing. But yeah. once he's cast down, his time is short. Yeah, and when he's cast down, he has great wrath. That's from Revelation 12. And he knows that his time is short. How short is his time? Well, we know it from Daniel. We know it, and especially we're going to come back to verse 14 in a, in a, in a short space of time. Michael fights the devil. He chucks the devil out of his sanctuary. That's what Daniel tells us. Chucks him out of his sanctuary. But before that, there is something important that happens. It's really, really important. Because the, the Satan doesn't want to come out of his, his dominion. He doesn't want to come out of his sanctuary. So he's restraining the Antichrist, for not giving him his full power yet, because he wants to stay up there as long as he can. He knows there's a fulfilling of scripture. He understands some of the scripture. He knows that his time when he's cast down will be short. And that's when the, the Antichrist gets his power. Up until that point, the Antichrist goes forth in war to conquer. There and now we're talking seals. But for three and a half, mostly it's going to be a Middle Eastern war. Daniel tells us that. It's mostly going to be a Middle Eastern war. But here we go, folks. Are you ready? Because when we read, when the word, how long does this go for in verse 13? How long is this? One angel asked the other. For how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices, the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host be trampled underfoot? How long? 2,300 days. Now we've got to be careful because, as I said last week, the third temple prophecy is is probably more important than the, the destruction of the second temple in AD 70. Because the third temple has to be built for these daily sacrifices that Daniel is talking about. Daniel, Dan, don't forget, Daniel hasn't even seen the second temple being restored. He doesn't see it. He is seeing a third temple being restored, not a second temple. He doesn't have understanding of this. But we know from history that it must be talking about a third temple. But in this third temple, there is going to be a restoration of the daily sacrifices. The Jewish people, the, the high priests, are going to start daily sacrifices. Can you imagine what the world is going to do then? This woke system that we're in, when they start slaughtering animals as daily sacrifices, daily sacrifices. There is going to be an absolute upheaval when this starts happening. But Daniel says when these two, when this event starts, it's 2,300 days. Till what? Well, four things. Four things happen. The beginning of the daily sacrifices, this verse 13. The desolation as spoken by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. When you see these things happen, the desolation. 
There is going to be a trampling in the temple, the holy sanctuary, the temple, and there is going to be a trampling of the hosts, God's people, you and me, and the Jewish nation. There is going to be a trampling when this happens. Wow. And in verse 16, give him understanding. Give him understanding. Daniel, you need understanding on this. Verse 16. But look, Daniel, this isn't for you. So I heard the man's voice between the banks. Make this man understand, Gabriel. We know this is Gabriel. The bringing of messenger from God's very throne room. This is Gabriel talking with another angel. Give him understanding of the vision and i fell on my face face in verse 17 understand son of man that the vision refers to the time of the end daniel this is not for your time this is the time of the end this isn't about antiochus epiphanies this is the time of the end when the daily sacrifices are restored in the temple it's going to be there's going to be a another it may, you know, a horrible desolation of that temple is going to be trampled. This is the time of the Gentiles. There's another one. This is the time of the Gentiles where they trample in the courts of the temple of God and they trample all over Jerusalem. This didn't happen when, when Jerusalem was restored back. The two halves, east and west Jerusalem. This is talking about, this is the time of the Gentiles. Where they're going to trample all over the temple. They're going to trample in the Holy of Holies. They're going to trample on the people, you and me. So then we see the, you know, verses 20, 22, the rise of Persian media, the Greek empire, the rise of the Antichrist. Power in verse 24 is given to the, the, to the dragon, Satan is given to the antichrist he destroys he prospers and he th thrives and then we see you know amazing because daniel falls ill he's given this and he gets sick i love what the 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 new american standard version says i just love it because i think it gives a clearer understanding it says in verse 26 and 27 no 27 then i daniel was exhausted and sick for days I, Daniel, New King James, fainted and was sick for days. He's seen this and he's appalled. He has to take to his bed what he has given, what he has shown. It makes him sick. He is, could you imagine, he has shown what is coming. And it makes him sick. But look, look, we have been showing, we're going to, I'm going to show you what's going to happen, when it's going to happen. But folks, we must be like Daniel about the king's business. We have got to be about the king's business. We've got to be upholding the truth. We've got to start proclaiming the, the good news of the kingdom of God is at hand. We've got to start proclaiming and be that voice in the wilderness. The returning of the Lord is soon. We've got to be about the king's business. Not just waiting for everything to happen. Right, so here we have option one. I'll give you option two. From the interpretation of the New American Standard Bible, you know, from verses three, 13 and 14, um, it's saying when, when, when the transgression causes horror and allows both a temple and us to be trampled, well, it tells us 2,300 days. But when does that 2,300 days start? Well, this is one thought, right? So we know that if we add 1,260 days, add them to, together, what, what do we get? 2,520 days. Yes? We get that? So, so let's break it down into days and, and months. I mean, it, this is where the headache came in for me. Um, so we break it down. So we know that the first half of the second of, of, the, of the first 
seven years, the first half, the first three and a half days, uh, years is 1,260 days. We know that the second half is 1,260 days. Agreed? Right, add those together. Right, this is where it gets really important. So what, what some people say in their interpretation is when do we start the 2,300 day countdown? Well, we start, some people say, from the interpretation of which Bible you read, from the New American Standard Bible, they say, well, it must do when the desolation happens. So let's take that, that one forward. So there are, there are things going to happen that he's saying. It's the desolation, but it's also the restoring back of the daily sacrifices. So it's the, the stopping of the daily sacrifices to the restoring back of the daily sacrifices is 2,300 days. Yes, do we agree? Can I just reiterate that? It says in verse 14, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleaned. Read it in the other version. Verse 14 in the, in the New American or your NIV. For 2,000 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. So it's the restoring of the temple. For what to happen? Daily sacrifices. That's going to throw most people out. Daily sacrifices. So if we take, I'm just going to get my calculator. If we take the 2,300 days and we take it from... 1,260, we take it from the second half of the three years, the last half of the three and a half years, the 1,260 days. Then we take 2,300, sorry, 1,260 days from the 2,300. So we take 1,260 days off the 2,300. We're left with that figure. 1,040 days. Divide that by 30. Right? It's, it's, over, it's just, over, just over or just under three years. It's 2.8 years. Two, two, two years, eight months. So is this Bible, is this verse that the, the, the restoring of the temple and the daily sacrifices, is that going to happen? 1,060 days after the return of the Lord. That's how some people have interpreted this. It's the restoring back of the sanctuary. Does that happen at 2.22 years and eight months, thereabouts, of the temple being restored in the thousand-year reign? See? Gets complicated. Told you it would. You've got to make up your own minds because don't forget Zechariah and Ezekiel, Ezekiel 38 and 39 tells us, tells us that when this big battle happens, we can't go and touch areas for seven months. We can't touch the bodies for seven months. So that must happen in the thousand year reign. It must happen after Jesus has come back. Listen, the coming of the Lord doesn't just go, da -da, doesn't do that. The Bible clearly doesn't say that. And we're going to get into that when we do our Bible study of Daniel 11. Continue on the Bible study of Daniel 11 from verse 31. Clearly tells us by Daniel 12. Wow. It does tell us. It does tell us something. Because Daniel 12, the end of Daniel 12, just turn with Daniel 12. Just flip over a couple of pages. Look at this. Right, verse 11 of Daniel 12. For from the time that the daily sacrifices is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Ah, oh, but blessed is he who waits and comes to the one, the two, the 1,335 days 
Andy, I thought you said that the, the, the Antichrist comes for 1,260 days. I did. But from the time of the daily sacrifices, something happens in that extra 30 days. Because folks, listen to me. When Hitler was defeated in 1945, what happened next over the next year? Well, we saw the Nuremberg trials happen, where his commanders, all his chiefs, all these Nazi party leaders, you know, were, were put on trial. It doesn't just simply, it's not a clear, simple, boom, this happens. Something happens in that 30 days. I think I, from my understanding, I think I know what happens in that 30 days. Because when the commanders of the devil's army, the Antichrist army, they're going to be shattered. But it doesn't happen in one day. And when God, Jesus, goes forth to reclaim his people, it tells us where he goes to. To totally tells us where he goes to. It isn't in a day. It's over a series of days. But blessed is he who waits to the 1,335 days. There are people waiting for this. Who? Us. Ta-da! Put that one in your pipe and smoke it. There is going to be a body of people counting down these days. Why? Because we're going to have wisdom and understanding of these days. But here's my thoughts, right, from the understanding. I'm going to go back to option two. This is my understanding, right? Now, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But when I've poured and literally prayed over these scriptures for months and months and months, not if, you know, it, I would say for years I've been pouring into these scriptures. Here is my understanding. Because we're going to get to Daniel 12 in the Bible study. Here is my understanding. Right. The seven-year seven tribulation. I believe from Daniel that 220 days of the beginning of this last seven years, we're going to see what? The daily sacrifices happen. Right? The daily sacrifices start at almost the beginning of the last seven years. A temple is being built. The, 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 the people come back in and, and they start doing, you know, all the, 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 the Levites start performing the, you know, in, the, in the third temple. They start doing this. And they start doing the daily sacrifices. So here it is, folks. I believe that 1,040 days later of the beginning of sacrifices, we see the Antichrist come on the scene. In his fullness, where Satan comes down. So 1,040 days after the beginning of the, of, of the daily sacrifices, so add on 220, it brings up to 1,260. 1,000 after the daily sacrifices start, 1,040 days later, bang in halfway of the seven years of the Great Tribulation. The whole seven years is the Great Tribulation. But this is when I believe that Satan is cast down. Why? Well, Daniel 12, 7 says that. I'm going to turn to these scriptures because I want, I'm going to take, take my time on this. Verse 7. Then I heard a man clothed in linen. He was above the water in the river. Always happens by a river. Interesting. That's the thing. And he held his right hand and his left hand to heaven. And he swore by him and lives forever. It shall be for a time, times and half a time when the power of the holy people is completely shattered and all these things shall be finished. A time is one year. Times is two years. There's three years. And half a time is half a year. Three and a half years. Right. And then look at Revelation 11, verse 2. Did I write that down? Sorry, Revelation, yeah. Revelation verse 2. 
but leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. This is the time of the Gentiles. It will be given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. If you take 30 days as being the Jewish calendar, which it is, it's three and a half years. It's a hundred. It's 1,260 days. So we got another one, three and a half years. Then go over the page to Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared for her by God, that they should feed her there for 1,260 days. So there it is, three and a half years, 42 months. Revelation 12, 14. But the woman was given the wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to places prepared where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time, three and a half years. And then turn over the page, Revelation 13, verse five. I could pick so much more. They worship the dragon who was given authority to the beast. So Satan is now, he is not the restrainer anymore. He has been cast down to, to, to the earth with all of his minions. And now the daily sacrifices are taken away and the treading and the trumping and the trampling that we see in Daniel 8 is starting to happen. Gave authority to the beast and they worshipped the beast who was able to, who was like the beast, who was able to make war with them. He was given the mouth, verse five, the mouth to speak great things and blasphemy, blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for how long? 42 months. 1,260 days. This is the last three and a half years. This is when the, I believe, the seven years starts, 220 days into the seven years, the daily sacrifices start. Because you go back to Daniel 8, and it says, when the sanctuary for 2,300 days, when then the sanctuary will be cleaned, cleansed. So you go on 200, 220 days, go forward 1,060 days, and that is the start of when the, the sacrifices are taken away and the trampling is happening. So how many days have we got left? Just do the calculation. If you get a, a watch out. So 1,260 times two equals 2,520 days. Take 220 off equals 2,300 days left. Take up to the, the middle part of the 1,040. And then we see the Lord's return and the temple is restored. So could Daniel be telling us something in the 1,290 days and the 1,235 days? I think two things happen. This is my interpretation. He got 1,260 days into it. Then we got 2,300 days into it. I believe that Jesus comes back, fights this army with his army in the 1,260 days. It's over. That's the time of, of Satan is then, you know, his army is defeated. The Antichrist is defeated by the Lord. That's what the Bible says not by human hands. That's what Daniel says. The Lord defeats him. But what happens next for this next 75 days? Well, we were told this, especially Daniel 11. 
we'll have a look at this on on Tuesday night. That Jesus, I believe, for 30 days starts off in the um, Saudi Arabian Peninsula, Mount Zion, starts going through that peninsula from Mount Zion, where all the people have been scattered. His remnant, the woman who goes to places prepared for her in the wilderness, goes to places where? Flee. Revelation, uh, Matthew 24, flee to the mountains. And Daniel tells us where they go to in Daniel 11. He goes to three places. Have a look. Daniel 11 goes to Edom, Moab, and Amman, which is all in Mount Sinai, parts of Saudi Arabia, parts of Jordan, Bosra, which is the, the, the capital of Edom. And I believe he goes to collect his people that are in the wilderness from all four corners of the earth. And he brings them back to where? Jerusalem. But blessed is he that waits to the 1,235 days. What's going to happen? The restoration of sacrifices, the restoring of the temple. Wow. And some of us will see it. Some of us, because it says, Daniel says, Daniel 8 and Daniel 12. Blessed is he, verse 12 of Daniel 12, who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. 75 days after the 1,000 and 1,260 days. 75 days. I believe the Lord is going around this earth collecting his people. Both Jews and Gentiles. Believers. I'm not sure anymore if we're taken out pre wrath Listen, when let's, let's use the book of, e of Exodus as an end time book. Were the Israelites taken out when the, when, the, when the 10 plagues hit Egypt? No. When God poured his wrath on Pharaoh, were, were, the, were the Israelites protected? Yes, but they were still there. I believe, this is where I'm, I'm throwing out my book and my beliefs. I believe that we go through it. I believe some of us will be alive and see the Lord's return, the Lord gathering his people in war. It isn't just over in one day, folks. It isn't like 1,260 days he comes and then 1,261 days it's all over. There's cleaning up to do. There's a capturing of the commanders of the army. We know they're put on trial. We see that in Isaiah. We see that in Ezekiel. We see that in the, in the Old Testament books, that these commanders in Psalm 110, we we're seeing that the commanders are put on trial. There's biblical prophecy that lines up all of us. I think I've got Psalm 110 right. I hope I have. I know Heidi's probably looking at it now. But folks, this is why it is so important that we are aware and have understanding and prayerfully ask for wisdom and understanding. Not so that I can give you, this is what, and aren't I good, look at me. It's not about that. I'm not trying to, you know, dispute somebody else's theory or dispute somebody else's understanding. There are great men and women who have written books on this. But just in my humble opinion, I believe that the daily sacrifices start at just 220 days after the first start of the seven years. If, what happens if when we see that? When we see the daily sacrifices starting, we can go 2,300 uh, 2, days. Because <gasps> that's what Daniel says, till the restoration of the sacrifices and the temple is restored.
This is why when we start seeing things happen out there, we can line them up in the Bible. There is a federation coming together as we sit here. There is going to be a leader arising out of something somewhere. Tells us, here's a, here's a little clue for you. Where did Alexander the Great rise from? Macedonia. Where is the eastern side of Macedonia now, today? Turkey. The little horn comes out from these four kingdoms. Turkey, Assyria, these places. Are you getting this? And look how we arise. We discussed this in, in Daniel 11. He starts making war, riding forth to conquer. The seven seals start breaking. You see the four horses of the apocalypse walking, going round. But in our Western mindset, we've, I think we've got things screwed up. And my, my, my plea to you is study it for yourself. Don't go on the internet. Don't listen to what other people's teachings are. Go and check facts and figures. Like I looked at the, the kingdom of Macedonia. I checked it on a map. The ancient kingdom of Macedonia. It's there. So folks, you know, don't shoot me down because this is my opinion. I'm, come, I'm trying to get my understanding of this word. And it's mind boggling. It is, it is mind blowing. But I think Daniel, for me, is one of the most prophetic books, as well as Ezekiel and Isaiah and you know, all the things I've mentioned before, one of the most prophetic books in the Bible. And those that get understanding get light on them. And people will be attracted to that light. This is the message that we will take forth. It's not just signs and wonders. I don't know why the charismatic church had got so enamored with signs and wonders. Yeah, hey, it's revival with the, yeah. No, we're going to be telling people what's coming. We're going to be preparing when they suddenly realize, oh my word, what does that mean for me? If the Lord becomes, where does that leave me? Well, you're going to be in one, one or two camps. You're going to be in the camp of the goats who get slaughtered or the camp of the sheep who gets protected and provided for and brought into the temple. Well, I better get my life straightened then, and Chad and I. Show me how. They're going to come to us. This is the message that we're going to take forth because also we might be a witness through the way that we die and martyred for our beliefs. Who love their lives, not unto death. Daniel 12, 11. We've got to be prepared. In my heart, I'm prepared. But my interpretation and my revelation on other passages of the Bible paint a different picture as well. It just builds up this picture. So my thing is, read Revelation 12 and 13. Read the book of Daniel. Read Ezekiel. Read, go through Zechariah. Go through Isaiah. Read the Psalms. Read Habakkuk, because it's about a bride preparing herself. That's a whole different message. We've been on that message for the last year. It's about a body of people preparing themselves. And this is all, the last, especially the last seven years, is all for a body of people to prepare themselves. In the greatest time of distress, the greatest time of trouble, Jacob's trouble of Jeremiah 30, the three woes out of Revelation, It's sobering, folks. But don't give Andy Tiplady's opinion. Get your own. Bring it to the table. And, and, and as I said to Ian and, and Matt, you know, Mark and myself, don't bring somebody else's theories to the table. Bring scripture.
Bring what the Lord is telling you, not what you've listened to. Because when I'm done with this, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Is I'm going to start listening to what other people are saying on this. And I've got a sneaky suspicion that it's not far off what some people are saying. Sneaky suspicion. I didn't listen to, to Brother Sadhu on Daniel. Um, but I, I'll tell you now, I, I don't think it'd be far away from what he said. And it might add something because I cut my hedge from this side and he might cut his head, the same hedge from the other side. We're cutting the same hedge. Do you, you know, somebody else might cut the top of the hedge. It's the same hedge. It's just different parts. Just brings things together a bit, bit bigger, the complete picture. I'd like to see Brother Sadhu cut the other side of the hedge, actually. And we would have a great conversation. And then somebody else will do the top, maybe Mark. Yeah, we'd have a great conversation. But folks, I hope that, haven't, that hasn't baffled you. I hope that has provoked you to get into this word, but not just your favourite Bible. Yeah, not just, you know, the New King James or the King James or the NIV or the New American Standard Version, you know, Bible. You know, have a look at what other Bibles say and have three or four around. I have, I've looked at it from so many different angles. My mind is boggled. <laughs> I'm toasted. You should have seen me last night after six hours of studying this, asking the Holy Spirit, six hours of, of something I know relatively well, have preached on. I still, just in one chapter, get stuck in for six hours. And my head was toasted. So join me on Tuesday for the Bible study of Daniel 11. And we'll go right the way through to Daniel 12. And the 12 verses in Daniel, it gets deeper. But study the Bible for yourself. Bring not somebody else's thoughts. Bring your own to the table. Let's cut this hedge from all different angles, but make sure it's the same hedge. <laughs> God bless you, Adi. I know that you want to say something. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Thank you. You've poured yourself out, as always. Um, what I Something that's really hitting me over these last weeks is how easily we can be nurtured into ways of thinking that are not necessarily scriptural. Uh, through churches and through well-meaning people, through through you know organisations, and I think this is some of the thing that is like I just want to be washed clean of. It's almost like a form of to use a, a bit of a strong word indoctrination, but we can be in, in so influenced through um, through our tra traditions of our former denominations or former or, or present denominations whatever you know wherever you find yourself and i think what's really important and this is what andy i know is really wanting to do and i think we're working together in this is to let's just declutter let's take out out all these preconceived understandings these assume, these assumptions and and actually put them to the side and let's look at scripture without being influenced by how does it fit into my preconceived understanding of end time scenarios and events and i think this is just really important for us to do this together yeah. so i think that's all part of what you're going andy yeah absolutely because there's some very interesting comments i'm just having a look at some comments now please forgive me i'm, I'm I, I i struggle when i read new things but fionola fionola morris says something very interesting matthew 24 verse 14 jesus said the gospel will go around the world then the end will come looks like no rapture till we've helped bring in the great harvest absolutely right bang on another one said here um uh, wedding feast what about the wedding feast i don't know i don't know when the wedding feast happens i know what will happen but i'm not sure whether it's going to be this side of the thousand year reign or the other side. I don't know, but I know what happens. I know that there is going to be a wedding feast. I know there's going to be a wedding supper. Blessed is he who comes to the supper of the lamb. You know, I know there is, but we've got to make ourselves ready. 
And I don't know whether that's in the thousand, I suspect it's in the thousand year reign. I suspect it is. I don't yeah, know. that's good. And the other thing I just really wanted to point out, you know, that it, we aren't going to be tested on the, by the Lord on, on knowing all the numbers and all the rest of it, but we are to be responsible and study for ourselves. Yeah, and yeah. Um, like Andy has keeps saying, and I totally agree, is that, you know, to be the sons of Issachar, um, to know the times and the seasons, to know what's coming, to advise. We, we can't just be sitting there like, oh, it doesn't matter. All I need to do is love the Lord. And all I need to know, I, I all I want to know is I just want to know Jesus. And it's like, oh, come on, come on. The word of God has been given to us at a humongously great price. So much blood has been shed for us to have the word of God, to have the details, to have the content that is totally God inspired. And we know that it's useful for teaching and rebuking. And I can't remember the other two, Andy, you always remember it off by heart much better than I do that particular verse. But the, the scriptures are important. The prophecies contained therein are for us not to just go like, oh, isn't it nice? You know, we haven't been we haven't been called people just to be saved. I keep saying this. We've been saved because we've been called to Absolutely a higher purpose. Absolutely right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but you know, this is like eternal purposes of God, eternal. And it's, um, and I just want to remind us in Revelation 14, verse 12, when, you know, we're talking about the angels that are going forth, we're talking about the 144,000, and this is, uh, we're talking about the seven angels with the seven plagues that are just about to come. And it says in the midst of all of this, um, that this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Amen. Um, and, you know, again, I mean, I don't have to reiterate, but it's, it, if, if we were all raptured out by this point, we wouldn't have to have patience and we wouldn't have to have endurance. Um, so I'm not even mentioning that I'm saying this for that purpose to undermine the pre-trib rapture concept. What I'm saying is, our focus in these times and in these studies is also that Lord, may I, may we be patient, may we endure. Lord, give us the strength of the ox to endure what's to come. Lord, and may we remain faithful to you, Jesus. And this is my prayer for me, for my family, for my son, for you all. Lord, may we be faithful. May we endure all that is to come. Lord, may we not have this lazy attitude of just like, oh, I can't be bothered anymore. Let's just get out of here. Lord, may we endure. May we, may we fulfill the plans and the purposes. May we be that bride that is prepared and is given white garments of linen, Lord. May we be that people. And uh, I just want to encourage you, if you feel baffled a little bit, don't worry. Um, it's all part of the undigging. It's like digging up a hard ground, you know, because for, for the plants and for the seed to grow, it needs to be um, loosened. And I think this is all part of it. Loosen up the ground so that the seed, the true word of God, can grow within it and it can be oxygenated and that we can just really get the revelation of the Lord for these times. So we're on a steep learning curve uh, because we're actually undoing, we're, we're undoing lots of the old stuff and we just want to get the truth and we want to get our own personal thing. So just to clarify, when Andy says, don't listen to other people's teachings, what you also mean, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, is what you mean is, yes, you may have heard these teachings in the past, do not adopt it as automatic, this is therefore correct, and this is the full truth, and this is my mindset from here on. What he means is, yes, I, I have heard in the past lots of teachings, do not adopt other people's teachings simply per se as this is the truth, therefore this is my opinion, and that's it. No, seek, seek, seek for yourself. You know, seek the kingdom of God. And Jesus said that he came to fulfill the laws, the words of the law and the prophets. And he is not actually coming up with anything different except for what has already been told through his prophets, which I find incredibly humble of him as well. So, you know, what he is teaching is Old Testament prophecy. So once again, you know, this modern culture of like, oh, let's just focus on the goodness of God, the New Testament where God's always happy, Old Testament, God's miserable and angry. You know, that's just like, we have we are living in such a messed up church environment and society these days so be an ambassador for the whole the whole truth 
be an ambassador for the kingdom, the king who's returning and he's going to come and bring judgment and justice and evil will be done away with once and for all. And I can't wait. Amen. Amen. So um, after that, uh, June and Paul, you, you opened up in prayer. Would you like to just close in prayer before we say goodbye to our streamers? Because that would be really lovely just to wrap it up with you lovely people. Thank you. Father, I just want to thank you that your word says that we're to study, to show ourselves approved, a worker who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. And I thank you that Andy encourages us to do that because we cannot stand on other people's revelation. We have to know the word of truth, mm -hmm. the revelation from the Holy Spirit ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I thank you, Lord, for the mm -hmm. privilege of bringing people like Andy to our attention so that we can be encouraged to take what they say and study it for ourselves. So I thank you, Lord, that you have given us the spirit of truth who leads us into all truth, Father Amen. God. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will work in each one of us in our Amen. lives and reveal to us what we need to know so that we can be ready and prepared. That bride without spot or wrinkle, Father God, who is the fullness of the statue of Christ, who tastes the power of the age to come and who can, as we're told in Matthew, endure to the end. So I thank you for that and I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And we want to send you all our love streamers. We yeah, bless love you. Streamers. Love you guys. Yep. And uh, we'll... real good, good. Thank you all for making comments. Thank you so much for you know your contribution. It's really valued. Um, and we're taking you with us when we go back to the building, by the way. Yes. We're still taking you with us. That's um, right. And our, on our and our Zoomers. Um, can I just say we're going to do the Bible study on Tuesday, beginning at 7.30, Tuesday. Um, which thing should we use, Heidi? Um, uh, today? No, I don't, no, no, a separate Zoom. So um, if people, I, I have had a couple, a few emails of people wanting to join. Um, just email info at bushfireministries.co.uk and I will send you the Zoom link to use to join us if you would like to. Is it the one for prayer that we're using? Yes. Right, okay. So those Zoomers, it's prayer. For our local yeah. Zoomers, same one as for, for Wednesday prayer. Yeah. Brilliant. All right, bless you all. Thanks again. Bye-bye. God bless you.